Today's uh, presentation and the people who are going to talk to you today, we cannot forget Thomas Hodgkin. And Hodgkin actually was born, actually died on this day back in 1866. He died this week on 1866 at age 67. He was an English physician and philanthropist who described Hodgkin's disease. He was probably the best well-known British pathologist of his time, and he had tremendous popularity. He was a great educator and teacher, but he was denied professional advancement. So he focused a lot of his career on philanthropy and on traveling. And he made a number of great contributions in that area as well. We also re want to remember Edmund Fisher. Edmund Fisher was born on this day back in April 1920. 1920 he was an American biochemist who shared the Nobel Prize with Edwin Krebs of the Krebs cycle. He, they won the 1992 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for discovery of reversible protein phosphorylation as a biological regulatory me mechanism, the idea that you can phosphorylate and dephosphorylate proteins and control their behavior. And of course, they did it in the uh, uh, area of glycogen metabolism, but this had important implications for biology in general, and it's been said to have fostered techniques that prevent the body from rejecting transplanted organs. Now, we also want to remember James Watson, uh, James Watson, as you know, won the Nobel Prize with Crick and Wilkins for the discovery of the molecular structure of nucleic acids and its significance uh, for the transfer of information in a living organism. He was born on this day back in 1928, and he actually published that article, uh, DNA Structure in Nature in 1953. And finally, we want to remember Jules Bordet from Bordetella pertussis, but we remember him for the following. He died on this day back in 1961 at age 90. He was Jules Jean Baptist Vincent Bordet. He was a Belgian bacteriologist and immunologist who in 1895 discovered complement. Complement, think about that important discovery, complex of proteins in blood that identifies foreign organisms and destroyed it. But he also isolated in 1906 uh, the, the, the bacterium that uh, causes whooping cough, and that is why it's called, or what's called, Bordetella pertussis. Uh, he developed the vaccine for it as well, and he isolated a number of other pathogenic bacteria, so he was quite influential. And with that, I leave you with Dr. William C., who's going to introduce our speaker of the day, so at the, the end of the day, you will know everything that is to know about graft-versus-host disease, and vice versa. Thanks, Jesse, for the wonderful opening introduction. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, uh, one of our key faculty at the BMT division, Dr. Maxwell Krem, and this is his second Grand Round. As you remember, he did an excellent Grand Round about a year ago. Dr. Krem has been um, joined us since May of last, oh, not, not last year, it's actually 2015. So he received his um, bachelor degree in uh, Wash U St. Louis, the chemistry in Spanish, which is very important, and he has been used the Spanish to take care of our patient in the clinic. So that reflects on that. Then he went on to receive his MD, PhD program, uh, degree at uh, Wash U as well, and received um, internal medicine training at Barnes Jewish and um, medical oncology, as well as bone marrow transplant at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Um, he is an excellent clinical educator and also research as well. Um, he has his interest both in bone marrow transplantation or also with general medicine with the mesenchymal stem cell, currently working with Dr. LaRosa in the cardiology department as well. So welcome. Thank you, William. So I chose the title because the, the dummy series takes very complex topics and distills the, the key aspects and, and, and shows the key points. And also because graft versus host disease is the major clinical challenge, I believe, in stem cell transplantation. And even experienced transplanters can occasionally feel like dummies when trying to confront the differential diagnosis and management of this problem. <clears throat> 
So it's not a commentary on my audience. So my disclosures are that I am the local PI for several clinical trials in our division that are industry sponsored, and that just about every medication, in fact, as far as I could tell, every medication that I'm going to discuss today is off-label. And that indicates the state of graft versus host disease, that almost everything we do is repurposed from another discipline. So uh, today I'm going to review etiology, risk factors, and symptoms of ZZHD, and we're going to spend a significant amount of time on the medications we use to try to prevent and treat ZZHD, and then we're going to try to focus uh, the, the uh, end of the talk on the major clinical challenges in graft versus host disease, uh, specifically steroid refractory ZZHD. So we're going to lead up to this with the basics of stem cell transplantation. And we're going to look at HLA matching, uh, the phenomenon of graft versus leukemia, and that's going to lead us to graft versus host disease. And we're going to look at what puts patients at risk for GVHD, how we assess the severity, how we diagnose patients, and most of the time will be on how we try to treat it. And we're going to focus on the unresolved questions in trying to prevent GVHD and trying to treat challenging cases. So in my field, there are two major types of hematopoietic stem cell transplants. There are autologous transplants in which the patient receives their own cells and there's no immunologic discrepancy. And then there's allogeneic transplants in which the patient receives cells from a completely different person. And we can describe allogeneic transplants along two major dimensions. One is the intensity of the chemotherapy and radiation regimen that the patients receive in preparation for the transplant. And we can consider those as ablative if they receive an intensive chemotherapy and radiation regimen. It ablates the recipient's marrow. Or reduced intensity, which is lighter dose chemotherapy and radiation. And I'll give examples of both. And then we look at what the donor source is for the cells. Is it a matched related donor, or is it an unrelated donor, which might be matched or partially mismatched? It could be an umbilical cord blood unit, or more than one. Or it could be a haploidentical donor, uh, a donor that shares half of the DNA, which is typically a parent or a child. So why do we do hematopoietic stem cell transplants? Well, they allow us to achieve some things physiologically that we could not do with standard chemotherapy. We can give higher doses of chemotherapy and radiation than would otherwise be possible. And this comes from the stem cell rescue aspect. We can also reconstitute the hematopoietic and immune system of the patient. And finally, we can achieve graft versus tumor effect with allogeneic stem cell transplants. And this is the major therapeutic mechanism behind an allogeneic stem cell transplant. So the phases of a stem cell transplant start with the preparative regimen that the patient receives, and that's called conditioning. So conditioning includes chemotherapy and sometimes radiation therapy. And then after the conditioning regimen, the patient receives the stem cells. And the transplant's not particularly exciting. They just hang them up in a bag, and they flow in. And that's followed by the engraftment and reconstitution of the hematopoietic system and the immune system, which typically takes place over a one to three month time frame. And after engraftment of the new immune system and blood system, we have the development of tolerance, which is the new cells coming to terms with their host, and that's the aspect of graft versus host. And there is an element of attempt at rejection that goes on, because you have two different immune systems. And the residual parts of the host's immune system try to fight off the graft, and that's host versus graft. So this is an example of an ablative conditioning regimen. And we see the patient receives eight doses of total body radiation, a total of 1,200 centigrade, which for total body radiation is intense, and then two days of high-dose cyclophosphamide. This is followed by a day of not receiving treatments, and then the 
stem cell infusion. And in, in our field, we typically term the day of the stem cell infusion as day zero. And this is a, a timeline schematic of a patient who receives a non-ablative transplant or reduced intensity. So there's uh, fludarabine is the chemotherapy drug. And there's one fraction of total body irradiation followed by stem cell infusion. And then over the next month, there is time for engraftment. And afterwards, there is the development of reconstitution of the immune system. And it's typical to assess how well the cells have engrafted in the ensuing time frame. And while this is happening, the patient is receiving medication to prevent graft versus host disease with a calcineurin inhibitor, such as cyclosporin or tacrolimus and an anti-metabolite like mycophenolate. And they stay on these medications for a prolonged period sometimes. So this is the concept of chimerism. So we can look at the recipient's cells, which are colored yellow, and the donor cells, which are colored cyan. And we can do restriction uh, polymorphisms and look at the length of poly G tracts uh, to characterize the recipient and donor molecularly to know who's who. And so after the transplant, there is a mixed chimerism. There are both donor and recipient cells present. And if our transplant is successful over time, uh, when we do the poly-G tract analysis, we will see that the donor cells have taken over. And there is complete donor chimerism if the transplant is successful. If the transplant is not successful, we would see graft failure where there is a small number of residual recipient cells. So this is the concept of haplotypes. And this is where we're going to look at what's a matched related donor. So this could be the patient who has a hematologic disorder. And the patient receives one copy of their two copies of the HLA locus, one copy from the father and one copy from the mother. And we see that father has two copies of the HLA locus and so does mother. And so in a large family, it's possible to have siblings with multiple different haplotypes present. And so in this, this family, this patient is lucky that there is a matched related donor who shares both HLA haplotypes. And the idea of a haploidentical donor is that the father or mother, if they were young enough and healthy enough, could be a stem cell donor for the patient because they each share a haplotype. The patient shares a yellow haplotype with the father. And that could be the basis for a haploidentical transplant. And for each sibling, there is a one quarter chance that that sibling could be an HLA identical donor. So the more siblings you have, the greater your chance of having a good donor for stem cell transplant. That leaves us only children out in the cold. So uh, this is why we try to do HLA matching. We want to avoid uh, intense immunologic discrepancies, which will re lead to immune system activations. So here we've uh, indicated six of the HLA loci, and they're all matched. And what happens is the two immune systems don't get into intense conflict. Whereas here, we have a mismatch. It actually, in this case, is bidirectional. So the DR locus has a, a mismatch. And both the host and the donor can see something that they don't have. So they recognize each other as non-self. And a boxing match ensues between the host and the donor. And on the host side, this could potentially lead to increased risk of graft rejection. And on the side of the donor, this could lead to more intense graft versus host disease. So this is a situation we'd like to avoid. Uh, in reality, we're going for something in between. We don't want a complete meeting of the minds between host and donor, because then there's going to be no immunologic intolerance of the leukemia cells. We want some boxing match enough to create graft versus leukemia, but not so much that we have severe graft versus host disease. So the ideal uh, clinical situation is somewhere in between uh, manageable graft versus host 
and good graft versus leukemia or lymphoma control. And this concept was demonstrated excellently in a study comparing transplants with identical twin donors and matched-related sibling donors. And looking at a large number of matched-related sibling transplants with a relatively smaller number of identical twin transplants because they're a little bit harder to come by, uh, Robert Gale in the 1990s demonstrated that for AML transplants, the identical twins had a much higher rate of disease relapse. So having uh, a non-syngeneic or a non-genetically identical transplant seemed to make a difference for both AML and chronic myeloid leukemia. And this was back in the time when we did a lot of allo transplants for CML because we didn't have the extensive array of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we do now. But you can see that the relapse risk for CML after an allogeneic transplant was nearly 60% for the identical twins, but less than 20% for mass-related donors. And that established that there was some graft versus leukemia going on in the more mismatched mass-related donors. And uh, as a pictorial representation, this is a CT scan of a patient uh, transplanted for lymphoma. And we can see there are a number of uh, lymph node masses in the abdomen. Uh, between day 103 and day 153, the donor immune system matures to the point at which it can recognize antigens on the recipient's lymphoma as foreign. And the result is that this lymph node mass shrinks substantially. This lymph node mass here uh, shrinks substantially as well. And there are other lesions in the abdomen which appear to disappear also. So this is an example of graft versus disease or graft versus leukemia in action. So this brings us to graft versus host disease because that's the flip side of the coin of graft versus leukemia. So an immune system does one thing. It can distinguish itself from non-self. And in the case of disease control, that's graft versus leukemia, but unfortunately, there are other organs in the body as well, because you take an immune system and place it in a completely new and, to it, foreign environment. And when it recognizes those other organs as foreign and goes on the attack, that's graft versus host disease. The acute phase has traditionally been thought of as a T-cell-mediated process, but that's not completely true. It's not only T-cells. And the chronic phase we generally think of as both T cell and B cell mediated. And the most common organs involved are the skin, the gut, and the liver. So what happens with graft versus host disease is that the transplant results in the increased expression of host epitopes. And in patients who undergo an ablative transplant and have tissue damage, there's even more expression of epitopes because they're exposed from cells dying, and pro-inflammatory cytokines are released, and all these factors lead to the activation of T cells from the donor. And the donor T cells expand, and ultimately they're recruited to attack the tissues in the recipient. And I would like to point out that there are T cells, which are good T cells, so to speak, in this process, called T regs. These regulatory T cells help put a break on the cytotoxic T cells and the T cell activation and suppress graft versus host disease and generally suppress inflammation. And B cells also play a key role. They are integral to the function of the T cells because they help present antigens, they secrete cytokines, and they also elaborate antibodies. So what puts someone at risk for having graft versus host disease? Well, the one risk factor which I didn't put on this slide and is the essential one is receiving an allogeneic stem cell transplant. If you did not receive an allogeneic transplant with a very few exceptions such as solid organ transplants where passenger lymphocytes came along or exceedingly rare instances of blood transfusions where passenger lymphocytes can come along, 
unless you get an allogeneic transplant, you cannot have graft-versus-host disease. Within that population of patients who receive those transplants, patients who have mismatches at the HLA locus are at increased risk. And this includes, includes mismatches that are serologically detectable, which we call antigenic mismatches, and mismatches which don't result in a serologic reaction, but can be detected by a difference in the sequences of the HLA genes. And those are called allelic mismatches. There are also minor antigen mismatches. So I talked about haplotypes earlier. And so in a matched related donor transplant, you typically inherit the entire haplotype from a parent. So those haplotypes are unlikely to have mismatches. But if you have a matched unrelated donor transplant, there is no inheritance. We've matched the HLA loci by a combinatorial process of searching a database. And so a lot of other unmatched genes can come along in the HLA locus. So matched unrelated donors have more GVHD because minor antigens have not been matched. It's not feasible to do that. Gender disparity also can increase risk of graft-versus-host disease. And this is unidirectional. That's because female immune systems haven't been exposed to and cholerized to Y chromosome antigens. And therefore, when they enter a male body, they see the Y chromosome antigens, and they can react immunologically. Also, uh, females can have children, and the act of being pregnant exposes the immune system to new antigens. So we try to avoid multiparous females as stem cell donors, because they're more likely to be immunologically active. As I mentioned earlier, conditioning regimens can result in more exposure of antigens to immune systems. And so ablative or intense chemotherapy and radiation regimens increase the risk for graft-versus-host disease. And the final uh, variable that influences GVHD risk is the source of the graft. Peripheral blood stem cells, which are the easiest grafts to obtain typically, also carry the highest risk of graft-versus-host disease whereas bone marrow is intermediate, and cord blood seems to confer the lowest risk of GVHD. So which mismatch is worse, antigenic or allelic? And for many years, it was thought that the serologically detectable mismatch would be worse clinically than the allelic mismatch, which was only detectable by gene sequencing. And the answer is likely that both are deleterious. So in a retrospective study of almost 4,000 bone marrow transplant patients in the US, all of whom received ablative conditioning regimens, because back in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, we didn't uh, do non-myeloablative transplants, uh, the presence of allelic mismatch resulted in increased risk of acute GVHD and increased risk of mortality. Sorry, that's, that's any locus mismatch. So any mismatch resulted in increased risk of a bad outcome. Allelic mismatch also resulted in increased GVHD or mortality, as did antigenic mismatch. And if you compared antigenic versus allelic mismatch, there was no statistical difference in terms of the outcome uh, being uh, a more negative one. A similar study was performed with peripheral blood stem cell transplants, which are more common today. This study had a lower number of transplants and also included patients who received reduced intensity conditioning. So it was a bit more of a mixed bag, but they showed similar findings, that antigenic mismatch increased the risk of mortality by about 30%. Allelic mismatch was not as strongly linked to mortality increase but the study was somewhat impaired by the fact that allelic mismatches were not present at a high frequency, which undermined the statistical power of that question being answered. But notably, if you had two uh, mismatches, one allelic and one antigenic, that was just as bad as having two antigens mismatched. So the moral of that story is that it's better to have a full match than to have a mismatch. The mismatch does not provide an advantage in terms of stronger graft versus leukemia and disease control. And both allelic and antigenic mismatches are risky 
The one exception is that it's a DQB locus. Uh, there does not seem to be a preference uh, regarding matching or mismatching. So this finally brings us to the major clinical part of our talk. And so what are the symptoms of graft-versus-host disease? How do you know that that's what you're dealing with when your allogeneic stem cell transplant patient who is approximately 30 days after their transplant starts to have diarrhea and abdominal cramping. So GI symptoms can be lower gut or upper gut, including abdominal cramping, diarrhea, and in the upper gut, nausea, anorexia, and early satiety. And two of the symptoms that really clue you in that this could be GVHD in the upper gut are early satiety, filling up easily after eating small amounts, and the presence of abdominal cramping in addition to diarrhea. Skin GVHD manifests with the presence of a morbilliform or maculopapular rash early on if it's acute GVHD. And in severe cases, we can see erythroderma and uh, bulla formation. In the liver, we see hyperbilirubinemia and LFT elevations. Chronic GVHD manifests quite differently from acute GVHD. We often see what we call Sicca syndrome, which is dry mouth and dry eyes, much like Sjogren's syndrome. And we can see sclerodermatous skin changes and bronchiolitis obliterans in the lungs, myopathy, thrombocytopenia, and LFT abnormalities. Essentially, uh, GVHD uh, reconstitutes many of the features of autoimmune disease uh, in its various manifestations. Now, how do you know whether you're dealing with acute or chronic GVHD? What, what is the determining factor? And the answer is that it's not timing, but actually the disease manifestations, which are paramount. So chronic GVHD can occur any time after transplant if it's a chronic GVHD manifestation, though they tend to occur later on. And acute GVHD typically uh, is defined as these particular findings. And if they happen after more than 100 days, we call them late acute as opposed to chronic. And of course, patients can have elements of both. The most common scenario is that patients have some element of Sicca syndrome, which is usually their chronic component. And then, then they develop acute findings on top of that. So here's a uh, two images. One, the top is a morbilliform rash that would be seen in an acute GVHD patient. And in chronic GVHD, uh, that's more disabling and disfiguring. So we see morphia changes. And on exam, you would see that there is thickening of the skin and sclerodermatous changes. So this would be a more severe case of chronic, of chronic skin GVHD. And, and I'd like to make the point that chronic GVHD uh, has the potential to be uh, disabling because it can be present for months, sometimes years. So with GVHD, we often are confronted with a diagnostic challenge. Are we dealing with GVHD, or could we be dealing with an infection or perhaps some other toxicity? For example, something due to the conditioning regimen or due to medications that we're utilizing. So the differential diagnosis can often be broad and we deal with disease-related findings, medication-related findings. And uh, many times, we actually have to turn to uh, our colleagues in other divisions to get biopsy material. And sometimes the biopsy material helps us decide if we have GVHD or perhaps an infection. But to decide what we're dealing with, the clinical scenario is, is the major indicator. Pathology is an adjunct. We usually get pathology as a tiebreaker when we're not sure, for example, in the gut if we're dealing with uh, infectious colitis versus uh, graft versus host disease. Often that pathology specimen will be our key to knowing which direction to go. And, and oftentimes, it doesn't give us the answer. And we're left with a conundrum. So 
GVHD is relatively common in allogeneic transplants. In patients who have a related donor, approximately half the time, uh, the studies say between 10 and 50 percent, but I would say it's about half the time you'll see some form of acute GVHD. And the, the risk is higher in matched unrelated donors. About two-thirds will experience some type of acute GVHD. Chronic GVHD is just as common, and 30 to 50 percent of matched related donor transplant patients will have chronic GVHD. And once again, about two-thirds of patients with a matched unrelated donor transplant get chronic GVHD. So the moral of the story is that almost all allogeneic transplant patients get some form of GVHD in their treatment course. And, and the one you want to get is chronic GVHD that's manageable, because that correlates with improved survival. Chronic GVHD correlates with graft versus leukemia over the long term. This slide is, is not to be memorized, but is to demonstrate that we can grade the severity of GVHD. So we look at the intensity of the manifestations in an organ. So in acute GVHD, we look at skin, gut, and liver. And we see how bad the rash is, or how intense the diarrhea is, or how high the bilirubin is. And we integrate those values into what we call the grading. And so we have grades one and two, which are mild GVHD. And so there's a delineation here between grade two and grade three. And grade three and four, are what we would call non-mild or severe GVHD. And the organ that typically is the decision maker in this calculus is the gut. Diarrhea, more than one liter per day, will put you in the non-mild category. We also can do similar grading for chronic GVHD. And in chronic GVHD, we look at the number of organs involved. And we look at the severity of organ involvement. And the organ that drives primarily the severity of chronic GVHD is the lungs. So lung GVHD in, in chronic is the worst GVHD that you can have, because it typically is irreversible. So in acute GVHD, lower gut is the organ you don't want to have manifestations in. <laughs> And in chronic GVHD, the really bad one is lung. So this brings us to how do we prevent this from happening. And so we try to prevent GVHD with our prophylaxis regimen of combined immunosuppressants. And this is the current standard uh, for most transplants. It's, it's certainly the non-ablative transplants, we would use a combination of a calcineurin inhibitor cyclosporin or tacrolimus, plus mycophenolate. And the prophylaxis starts before the transplant, a few days before. We want to have therapeutic drug levels uh, in preparation for the arrival of the stem cells. And patients will be on prophylaxis during the hematopoietic and immune reconstitution. And then over the next several months, hopefully as tolerance develops and graft-versus-host disease wanes. So this is the theoretical model that we pursue. So I have tried to create a, a diagram of the different possibilities for graft versus host disease prophylaxis. And I've indicated that for non-myeloablative versus ablative transplants, historically, we've pursued different approaches. So the first transplants that were done were all ablative, high doses of chemo and radiation. And patients received the calcineurin inhibitor, cyclosporin, uh, typically, and then later tacrolimus was introduced, combined with methotrexate. And then as non-ablative transplants were developed in the 1990s in the laboratory, and then clinically in the first decade of uh, this millennium, we had mycophenolate as an immunosuppressive choice. So mycophenolate for the non-ablative, methotrexate for the ablative, and other groups have utilized sirolimus, and for haploidentical transplants, cyclophosphamide has been used in addition to multi-agent immunosuppression. So the mechanisms of action of these drugs in general are to block T cell and B cell activation or to block T cell and B cell replication. 
So the calcineurin inhibitors primarily block activity, whereas the anti-metabolites both block activity and replication of the lymphocytes. Sirolimus uh, works inside the cells to block signaling because it targets the mammalian target of rapamycin pathway. And cyclophosphamide is a really interesting drug. It's probably the drug among all of these that has been around the longest. And it is a chemotherapy drug which works as an alkylator, which is a DNA crosslinker, but it also can suppress T and B cell activity and can work as an immunomodulator. And recent uh, studies suggest that cyclophosphamide can actually favor and support the proliferation of T regulatory cells. So uh, cyclophosphamide is a very interesting immunomodulator. So usually the backbone of our immunosuppressive prophylaxis regimen is a calcineurin inhibitor plus another drug. So what are the questions in prophylaxis? And the answer is that there are several, and most institutions do their prophylaxis differently. And is this based upon clinical data? Is this based upon laboratory data? And I would argue that no, it's not. It's, it's based upon history and uh, institutional and personal preference at institutions. So many institutions like to use antithymocyte globulin in their prophylaxis. Antithymocyte globulin is a polyclonal antibody against T cells that's been typically raised in rabbits or horses. A randomized open-label trial conducted in Canada and Australia randomized 203 patients who were unrelated donor recipients to either pre-transplant rabbit ATG or no ATG. And in the trial, they found that freedom from immunosuppression at 12 months was improved in the ATG arm. But this translated to an increase in viral reactivations and did not translate to improved mortality or improved serious adverse events. So if you're an ATG fan, that's a little bit disappointing. And uh, a meta-analysis that was published a few years ago looking at trials that were conducted starting in the 1980s because this question has been asked many times. So this meta-analysis of six prospective trials with almost 600 patients showed that acute graft-versus-host disease was reduced in incidence using ATG. But once again, they were unable to demonstrate improved survival, improved disease control, or improved mortality related to transplant. And so the authors of this study did not recommend widespread adoption of antithymocyte globulin. But despite this, there are transplanters who believe that there is a justified rationale for using ATG. Another question is, which anti-metabolite is better? Should we use methotrexate in the ablative transplants and then use mycophenolate for the non-ablatives? Or, or could we use one anti-metabolite for all of our transplants? And the answer is that we probably can. So a, a Cochrane database review of this question of mycophenolate versus methotrexate with three trials and 177 patients suggested that outcomes were similar and that perhaps platelets engrafted faster and that the mycophenolate was better tolerated. There was less mucositis and need for total parenteral nutrition. And two more recent retrospective studies showed that engraftment appears to be faster when mycophenolate is used as opposed to methotrexate. And the two studies came to different conclusions about the incidence of GVHD. So I would suggest that mycophenolate uh, is an acceptable substitute for methotrexate, and it is likely better tolerated. Another question is, can we scrap the mycophenolate and calcineurin inhibitor altogether? They're inconvenient drugs. They have numerous side effects. Tacrolimus levels and cyclosporin levels have to be monitored. Tacrolimus and cyclosporin cause renal dysfunction and electrolyte abnormalities. What if we could 
let go of all of that inconvenience. So at Johns Hopkins, they've been doing transplants with cyclophosphamide prophylaxis alone. So they borrowed this from their haploidentical protocols. And they published data with 209 consecutive patients who received matched-related donor and unrelated donor transplants. They were not T-cell depleted. They didn't take any steps to try to, to game the system and reduce GVHD. And they gave cyclophosphamide at day three and day four post-transplant high dose, 50 to 60 milligrams per kilogram. And the rates of GVHD were in line with what we see historically for matched-related donor and matched-unrelated donor transplants. So acceptable toxicity, acceptable post-transplant outcomes in terms of survival. So this may be the wave of the future, simpler uh, to administer. Currently in the BMT division, we use mycophenolate as our sole anti-metabolite for standard prophylaxis. With, now, this does not include haploidentical transplants. In haploidentical transplants, we will administer post-transplant cyclophosphamide. But in matched-related donor transplants and matched-unrelated donor transplants, we'll use mycophenolate and taper it off by day 60. And our calcineurin inhibitor is tacrolimus. And we target therapeutic levels until day 60. And then we begin a slow taper with the aim to taper off six months after transplant. And taper schedule may be adjusted depending upon the patient's risk of disease relapse. We want the immunosuppression off if they're at high risk of disease recurrence. And if the patient's experiencing GVHD complications, we would consider holding the taper and providing extra immunosuppression. So that's prophylaxis. But often we have graft-versus-host disease that occurs, and we need to treat it. So the treatment of graft-versus-host disease in the mild setting, or grade 1 to 2 setting, is to continue the patient's prophylaxis regimen. And we would administer corticosteroids. And so this is the major treatment component. And the corticosteroid dose uh, has been shown that you can use 1 half milligram per kilogram or 1 milligram per kilogram per day. And a randomized trial uh, with Marco Milseric as the first author showed that you had equal outcomes using lower dose versus higher dose steroids. And for adequately mild GVHD that's very focal, such as upper gut only or skin only, you could use topical corticosteroids like triamcinolone or for the gut, beclomethazone and budesonide. So the goal is to use as little corticosteroid as you can because of the protein adverse effects of corticosteroids. We'd like to avoid systemic immunosuppression if possible, one, because of the side effects, and two, because it impairs graft-versus-leukemia or graft-versus-lymphoma. But in severe or non-mild GVHD, uh, we can't really get away with low doses of steroids. So we continue the prophylaxis regimen, but we use high doses of steroids, two milligrams per kilograms per day. And we typically give the corticosteroids until the patient has a symptom response. So in what I, what I should have mentioned in the mild GVHD is we typically give this steroid dose for somewhere between five to seven days. And then we taper that over one month uh, in the acute GVHD setting. Uh, in the severe GVHD setting, we often don't have responses that are as fast. And so we will often administer the high dose of steroids up to 10 to 14 days. And then we'll start a taper, typically over one month. But since we're starting at a higher dose, we may have to have a longer taper. So the patients, unfortunately, have a higher steroid exposure. Unfortunately, in this clinical situation, and this is one of the major challenges we face as transplanters is that severe GVHD does not respond as well as non-severe GVHD. And many patients have no response or an incomplete response to steroids after five days of therapy. And if after five days of therapy you have an inadequate response, that is termed steroid refractory graft versus host disease. This is a situation which often has very high mortality the mortality for steroid refractory gut GVHD in the acute setting 
is between 90 to 95 percent at one year. Other organs such as skin and liver tend to be less life-threatening and more responsive to treatment. Chronic GVHD is treated similarly to acute GVHD, except that the treatment courses are longer and that often additional adjunctive agents need to be used. So the, the challenge with chronic GVHD is it, it doesn't disable the patient or, or, or result in mortality quickly, but it can be present for months to years, and it can result in disability and can uh, disable patients and cause enough malnourishment or muscle wasting that their lives can be put at risk. So it can be serious, but it's usually a much slower course. So if I had to deal with refractory GVHD, I would rather have chronic GVHD because I have more time. But on the flip side, that's going to be harder to treat and get rid of. So for chronic GVHD, we often approach it with one milligram per kilogram steroids per day. And if the patient's on prophylaxis with a mycophenolate or calcineurin inhibitor, we'll often leave that in place. And adjunctive therapies include extracorporeal photophoresis, ibrutinib, bortezomib, other immunosuppressants uh, for certain localized uh, or one organ chronic GVHD, like skin GVHD, uh, PUVA or narrowband UVB can be very helpful. Uh, azithromycin is sometimes utilized as an immunomodulator in pulmonary GVHD, though I would say that the efficacy is not high. And for patients who have the Sjogren-like manifestations of chronic GVHD, especially dry mouth and dry eyes, we utilize topical therapies, uh, which can be lubricant-based or immunosuppressant-based, to control the inflammation and help control their symptoms. And once again, we try to use the topicals and the non-systemic treatments as much as we can because the systemic immunosuppression impairs their ability to control disease and increases risk of infection. So I'd like to focus the remainder of my talk on the biggest problem we have, I would say, in stem cell transplant, which is refractory GVHD. And in this field, we don't have a true standard of care. If you go to different institutions, you'll find different preferences based upon uh, anecdotal experience or which patients were lucky enough to have responses to certain agents or which clinical trial was developed there. But some of the drugs that are used are anti-thymocyte globulin, uh, IL-2 receptor antibodies such as diclizumab, TNF-alpha inhibitors like infliximab. We also will go back to agents that were in the prophylaxis regimen, such as mycophenolate or tacrolimus. Sirolimus is, is used very regular, regularly. Ibrutinib and bortezomib have been shown to have efficacy in the chronic GVHD setting when, when you have refractory disease there. And there are uh, some other therapies which are potentially less immunosuppressive, such as mesenchymal stem cells, which we're trying to develop here with Dr. LaRussa at the University of Louisville. And also we can administer extracorporeal photophoresis, which is an immunosuppressive therapy which is actually not particularly immunosuppressive. And I'll explain why. So ATG is often a go-to agent for refractory graft versus host disease. And I'm going to give you an example of the severity of this situation by looking at the clinical outcomes data. So the response rate is usually shy of 50%. And the one-year overall survival is approximately 30% for these patients. And in one study, the only survivors who were treated with ATG for steroid refractory GVHD were under 25 years old. The problem with ATG is that it's not easy to tolerate in terms of infusions. It can cause serum sickness. It can result in thrombocytopenia, which is not good for patients who have a, a new graft trying to uh, achieve success in the new body. And ATG uh, essentially 
destroys the T cells, and this creates substantially increased risk for opportunistic infections, especially viral and fungal infections. So patients are between a rock and a hard place, between their disease, their GVHD, and the infection risk. Sirolimus is frequently used for refractory GVHD, and its response rate may be better than that for ATG, but the data that we have to base these decisions on is somewhat scant. The largest study, case series for sirolimus use, was 34 patients. The median overall survival was short of six months, and one year overall survival was in the range of that afforded by ATG. And not without side effects. Even though it's an oral medication, we have to deal with the metabolic syndrome side effects of sirolimus. It can be myelosuppressive. It can cause pulmonary symptoms. In combination with tacrolimus, there is a much increased risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome, and drug levels have to be monitored very carefully. And one would not use the standard therapeutic drug levels, but actually aim for slightly lower than the usual therapeutic drug levels. And of course, with any immunosuppressive, you have increased infection risk. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on extracorporeal photophoresis, which is a different way of trying to treat inflammation. So the patients undergo placement of a phoresis-capable catheter, and the blood is pumped out of their body into a machine in which the blood is circulated, and the white cell-rich buffy coat is treated with a drug and then exposed to UVA radiation, which leads to leukocyte apoptosis. This is essentially giving PUVA, but to the buffy coat of the blood as opposed to the skin. And in a trial of 59 patients, there's actually an excellent response rate for skin GVHD and reasonably good response rates for single organ GVHD, such as liver and gut. Patients who had GVHD of multiple organs did not do as well. And for patients who responded to the treatment, there was a good shot at survival. For patients who did not respond to the treatment, the prognosis was dismal. And for all comers, the survival at four years was about one half. So to perform ECP, you have to have a phoresis-capable catheter. And of course, that comes with the risks of the catheter, which are infection risk and clot risk. The phoresis procedure poses a risk for destroying red cells and platelets. And in patients who have hematologic disorders and a graft that has been treated with other immunosuppressants, they may have cytopenias. And maintaining adequate counts to perform ECP can sometimes be a challenge. So this is usually most practical to do in the chronic graft versus host disease setting where you have time for the ECP to take effect, which can often be anywhere from three to six months, sometimes longer. And you typically don't have as much count suppression. But the good thing about ECP is that other than the catheter, it does not pose substantial infection risk. And these are the survival curves for responders versus non-responders. And you can see that there's a marked, unfortunate difference. So next I'll come to mesenchymal stromal cells. These are another uh, possible way to provide control of inflammation without providing marked risk of infection and other adverse side effects. So mesenchymal stromal cells are from the embryonic mesenchymal layer in terms of their origin, and they can be harvested from the bone marrow. And mesenchymal stromal cells act to quell inflammation in a variety of ways. They put the brakes on B cells and T cells, they put the brakes on dendritic cells, and they support the proliferation of Tregs. Mesenchymal stromal cells, as I mentioned, come from the marrow, and they have immunomodulatory effects. The the largest study was a study of 55 patients, a phase two study, in which they started off with HLA-matched patients and then proceeded to unmatched donors. And this is very interesting. You don't need to match the mesenchymal stromal cell donor. The MSC donor could be anybody off the street. And 
the response rate was north of 50%, did not depend on who the donor was, and the overall survival in responders, as, as we've been noticing, was around 50%, and non-responders did poorly. Uh, a meta-analysis of several trials showed that patients treated with this approach had 63% survival of six months, but unfortunately, two phase three trials that were conducted failed to meet their endpoint. And I wanted to comment a little bit about this. So in the phase three trials, uh, one of them was conducted by a company called OSIRIS, and they decided to make everything uniform by using the same donor for all the patients. So they had one mesenchymal stromal cell donor for all the patients in the trial, which meant that those cells had to be expanded for a large number of passages, and that might have caused those cells to lose their effect. So I would argue that rather, try and, rather than trying to treat the cells like a drug, they should be treated like a cellular therapy, and you should try to have the cells be as fresh as possible, with as few passages as possible. My comments about mesenchymal stromal cells are that the infusions are very well tolerated. There's a very low rate of reaction to them. They do not cause harm. They actually go in and heal inflammation. But to have this approach, you need a cell therapy capable facility, such as a good manufacturing processing lab. And we actually have one here at the University of Louisville, and Dr. LaRusso and I are interested in developing protocols to use mesenchymal stromal cells, perhaps in combination with other immunosuppressive drugs, to combat refractory graft versus host disease. So I'd like to uh, devote the very last part of my talk to an agent which has shown remarkable promise in treating chronic graft versus host disease. And this is ibrutinib. Ibrutinib is a drug you may have encountered because a lot of patients who are being treated for indolent lymphomas are being treated with this drug now. So ibrutinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is where the name of the drug comes from, in B cells, and also inhibits an IL-2-activated uh, tyrosine kinase in T cells. It suppresses lymphocyte signaling and growth. It basically interferes with the B cells' ability to derive growth signals from their environment. And in a multi-center phase two study, and of course the studies in this field often are small, there were 42 patients, but they had a variety of GVHD manifestations, so multiple organs were represented well. Uh, there was a very good response rate and some complete responses. And what's also important to note about this is that it was efficacious in multi-organ disease. So most of the trials previously have shown that you might have good efficacy in skin, but you would not have good efficacy in gut. Or you might be efficacious in skin and liver, but you wouldn't have efficacy in patients with multi-organ disease. And ibrutinib had similar responses across all organs. What you should know about ibrutinib is that it can cause fatigue and diarrhea and increases risk for bleeding. And patients who are anticoagulated probably should not receive ibrutinib. It is not strongly immunosuppressive. And in the trial, while there were 50% serious adverse events, two of which were fatal, that's probably a relatively low rate for a refractory GVHD trial. So this is a well-tolerated drug. The efficacy is promising, and this plot shows that over the course of treatment, over the first 48 weeks uh, of the responders, that the majority were able to be weaned from most of their corticosteroid dose. So this is a marker of success, the ability to wean these patients from corticosteroids down to less than, than 0.15 mg per kg per day is great progress. Agents that are in development include spleen tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which function similarly to ibrutinib. Uh, we have cytokine receptor or cytokine antagonists, such as tocilizumab. Uh, ruxolitinib, which is used for treating myelofibrosis, also has promising activity in treating chronic GVHD, particularly in the pediatric population. Maraviroc, an HIV drug, uh, and chemokine receptor antagonist, has activity in GVHD, it appears. 
and other agents such as alpha-1 antitrypsin and epigenetic modifiers, which reprogram cells, may have uh, potency as well. So to summarize, graft versus host disease is not just a T cell phenomenon. A lot of cells in the immune system are potential targets for intervention. We are making slow progress in risk stratification in determining which patients will have the most severe GVHD and how to appropriately target them for treatment. The standards of care in this disease for both prevention and treatment are not well defined, but we are making progress towards greater simplicity in our treatment protocols. And finally, for steroid refractory GVHD, historically, this has been a dismal prognostic situation, but there is some hope that more efficacious and better tolerated agents will be uh, available in a widespread basis. So I'd like to thank my colleagues in the bone marrow transplant division, uh, Dr. C, Dr. Basu, Dr. Chow, and uh, my collaborator, Dr. LaRussa, uh, my postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Sorab, and all the other staff who have collaborated with me in the care of patients and establishing clinical trials for this situation. So thank you. So I uh, would, would, would say that uh, the, my best answer to your question is, is a concept that John DePersio at Wash U has been exploring, which is including a suicide gene in, in the T cells that are given in the transplant, which is, for example, the suicide gene would be triggered by a drug like acyclovir. And if you give acyclovir, you can trigger the suicide gene and you could turn off or eliminate those T cells. Now, in a, in, a, in a clinical population, this is harder. How could you ask an unrelated donor to necessarily give extra samples of cells or, or, or be able to reprogram them? But th we may be getting there because with the CAR T cells, we can reprogram the T cell receptors. So it may be possible to reprogram T cell receptors to make them less immunoreactive in donors. And I think the, the big question for that is, can we do it selectively so that we can keep the graft versus leukemia, but also still lose the graft versus host? But I think that's in its infancy. I was intrigued by alpha-1 antitrypsin. How does that help? How does that work? Well, uh, I, well you know, inflammation uh, and thrombosis are closely linked. And I, I used to be a clotter in my previous research career many years ago. And it turns out that enzymes like thrombin uh, contribute to inflammatory damage. So you, you might hypothesize that putting the brakes on the proteases, uh, one, can directly control thrombin's role uh, and other proteolytic enzymes' role in inflammatory damage. And that may also put the brakes on epitope uh, exposure of the immune system. Questions, comments? Well, that's actually a, a very interesting idea because I, 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 was, I was thinking you were going to mention the fact that the, the PDL1 antagonists in, in, in clinical settings have been shown to be associated with severe uh, GVHD after allogeneic transplants. And so in, if you have an allogeneic transplant patient and they had relapse, you would not want to try to treat them with a PDL1 antagonist. Uh, but 
I, I'm not sure if that has, has, has reached clinical development yet. That, I, I would agree. That would be that would be something to try. Last question, three. No comments. Okay. Last question, three. Uh, thank you. I feel very scared. I'm a dummy. So <laughs> don't be me. Don't look at me. Um, why? Why uh, liver, stool, and gut? Why not kidney, bone, and else? So so the question was why are liver, skin, and gut the the most severely affected GVHD organs. And, and I think, I, I'm not sure I can provide you the best answer for liver, but I can tell you that gut and skin are major immune interfaces where a lot of antigen exposure and uh, infectious agent stoppage occurs and where the uh, lymphocytes are very active. And so I, I would hypothesize because those are major immune interfaces and, and barriers to infection, but that's also where we're more prone to have overactivity of the immune system that can be deleterious. Thank you. Yeah, we got a picture. Why don't you stand right there?